So, um, welcome to Mojo Sydney. So this is the first time that we've had this event at um, the ABC, which is very exciting and um, really looking forward to the presentation tonight from Peter Robinson. Um, some of you may know, Ian certainly knows that um, the meetups have been running since December last year uh, and they've been hosted at Fairfax. So um, this is their new home um, and they will run every month. So there'll be one in October, November, um, December, we'll probably take a, a break in January and so on. Um, so, for those of, who's, who's never been to a Mojo Sydney meetup before? Awesome. Okay, so I'll just run you through a couple of things about what this is about. So, um, my name is Corin Podger and I teach mobile journalism at Maclay College uh, down in Melbourne and I also teach privately. And I worked and lived in the UK for five years where I got to know a bit about mobile journalism before I came back to Australia 12 months ago. Um, and I realised that Australian journos and NGOs and public relations people and so on haven't maybe been as exposed to what you can do with a phone um, as much as people in Europe or the US. So I thought it'd be quite nice to have a meetup just to make you guys a little bit more aware of what's possible. So a little bit about mobile journalism. It's storytelling where reporters use portable electronic devices with network connectivity to gather, edit, and distribute news from his or her community. And right down the bottom, I put there, that's you. Um, how many journos in the room? Okay, and how many journos using their phones for work? For phone calls? <laughs> Email? Yeah. So I think when I think about journalism, I mean, I w was working for the ABC up until 2012, and my phone was part of my job. I just wasn't using it as much for photography or video that makes sense. And so I think if you're a journalist now in 2017, you are a mobile journalist, it's just useful to know what are some of the things that you can do with it. Um, on the right hand side are some of the news organisations that are starting to invest in a serious way in audio visual production using a smartphone. Um, and I'll just trundle over here and press play on this. It's going to do this for me. These are two short packages, uh, 30 seconds of each from different sides of the world about football. I don't need any support, I control the chair, I control the way I play. So it's great independence as well. Football so every single part of those two short pieces of work was filmed and edited on a smartphone. Um, the first one was done on an iPhone and the second one was done on an inexpensive Android phone um, in India. So it just gives you an idea of what's possible now. Um, so these meetups will happen every month. They're about knowledge sharing and networking. Uh, towards the end of the evening, I'll be looking for suggestions for um, a watering hole because we'll be heading there at seven o'clock. Um, I think Broadway Bar seems to be um, the, the one that is closest and, and most open. Also, um, this is a space for you to present your own work. So if you want to present one of these sessions, please don't feel um, freaked out or scared by it. This is a community and it's really nice, I think, to share what you're doing. and. Um, what I found is that it's a very forgiving environment where actually everyone just wants to learn and understand. So I'm looking for journos, but also teachers. And if you're working for a PR company or an NGO or just on your own that you're doing some interesting work, um, let me know. And there's a Facebook group. So if you um, just make a note of the hashtag Mojocom, um, that's a Facebook group that has over 3,000 members around the world um, of people just like us trying to better understand um, how we use mobile phones for storytelling. Uh, so you just need to send a, a request to join and you can be enrolled. Um, I don't manage it, so that's not advertising. And then your organisers and myself, and Bernie Sheehan, who's a digital trainer here, 
um, at the ABC. So those are our email addresses and Twitter handles, so if you need to get in touch. My Twitter DMs are open, so just reach out any time. Um, so I have great pleasure in introducing Peter Robinson. So Peter is, um, among many things, um, able to fly a drone and not hit the ceiling. <laughs> Um, and has been doing some really amazing work, I think, with the ABC on both understanding how this organisation can use drones for storytelling um, and also um, just in mastering this new technology and looking at what are the opportunities for that for a, for a big public broadcaster like the ABC. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Peter, and get your presentation Thanks, up for you. Thank you. Thank you. I might pull myself up a chair. Okay. Um, so uh, the obvious title for it was Drones and the ABC, but actually, um, when I started thinking about it, I started thinking that actually, rather than just offer you a laundry list of, of what we're actually doing at the ABC with drones, that uh, I'd offer something in hopefully a little more constructive. Uh, and tailored to uh, mobile journalism. So uh, let's have a, a little go. So we have <laughs> cutting edge uh, a bit of uh, a bit of context. I mean, they entered. We've all seen these sort of images. They entered public consciousness as you know lethal military rate, uh, uh, machines. Um, you know, tackling terrorists and all the rest of it. Um, but you know, alongside that, in a very short space of time, uh, you know, things have developed. I mean, you know, yes, you have, you know, bigger and heavier armored drones that can fly longer and are more expensive and kill more people and whatever. But alongside that, you also have this burgeoning um, consumer technology. I was uh, um, I was asked to do a submission for CASA, who was uh, uh, the Civil Aviation Safety Authority. They were they were asking people. Um, for, for what they thought. People who were using drones, they're asking them for what they thought about the current laws, uh, what they thought should or shouldn't be done. And um, they estimated that there are 50,000 drones flying across Australia, and that's gone from, you know, not very many, I'll wager, three, f even three, four years ago. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's like it's like dog years or something. I mean, the, the, you know, two, three years, or well, phone development, you know, two, three years are an eternity. Um, now, of course, I just thought I'd mention IS because they have been repurposing consumer drones uh, to do things like this. This is from something they shot from one of their, prop for their propaganda videos, uh, diving car bombs in. They'd also equip them with um, grenades and things. Um, DJI, the uh, market leader in consumer drones, they, they were so upset about this kind of thing uh, that um, they put in geofencing so that the things couldn't fly in parts of Turkey and Syria and Iraq and so on because um, it's not going to stop um, uh, this kind of stuff but at least it makes it more difficult. I think they didn't really want the attention but I mean you know these were off-the-shelf drones that people were buying. They're the same models. Uh, I've got a Phantom 4 here if anybody wants to look later um, that we use um, it's the same stuff, it's bought on, um, bought off the shelf. Um, so, you know, drones for bad, drones for good. Drones for good, this fantastic video that um, I found just while I was looking around on YouTube, it's from uh, Oregon State University, uh, doing some filming with drones off the coast of New Zealand. So those are blue whales. Uh, and they were initially using it for numbers and behavioral patterns and all this kind of thing. <coughs> Um, uh, and in the end they filmed something really quite extraordinary which I think is, here we go, it's just coming up I mean the, the beauty of using these drones for things like this is the, the water is so clear you, you know you can see right through it, you can see so much more uh, it's hardly bothering the way and look at that, I mean that's like extraordinary <laughs> extraordinary pictures Wow. Uh, so there are a lot of people out there using these things uh, as drones for good other examples that I've left aside movies, but you know commercials. And I mean, bear in mind that the companies that commission and pay for these kind of things, they're doing this kind of thing in a format. 
you know, which, which is playable in mobile. They're targeting mobile audiences. This is some crazy guy climbing a South American peak called El uh, Sendero Luminoso. What's that, The Shining Path? I'm not sure my oh God. Spanish is terribly good, but um, anyway, I mean, you know, extraordinary pictures that you would just not have got any other way. Um, and these are all, you know, put out and distributed on platforms that are the same ones that you're aiming for as well. Um, uh, and of course, journalism. Now, uh, we will have some sound for this one. These are just a couple of short bits from Four Corners. Our most experienced pilot here flies Four Corners, chap called Neil Maud, um, who got permission to fly around Hazelwood. So, um, you know, when, when, do you, when you get the chance to see you know these kind of um, you know these kind of views of the of, of the landscape, and, you know the towers and things like that. Um, uh, personally, I, you know I'm not got the drone bug, but I could watch them all day. Um, and this one is a fantastic shot. In northwestern New South Wales, the land is dry and unforgiving, and water is scarce. So for decades, behind huge walls of clay and dirt cotton growers have been building private dams that are simply staggering. Some of these stories are enormous, they're mind-boggling, they'll take your breath away, you're driving along, you drive for kilometres and there's just walls of storage. There are farms and cotton. I mean, pretty extraordinary. You can see to the sand, I mean, there's just some other stuff that we shot from the, the, the same trip. Um, I mean, I'm, you know, the, as as a reveal is, a, is is an obvious kind of trick in journalism and you know whatever thing you're doing but i mean you know the kind of reveal that you can do to back up your story and to lay your you know lay your story out on the table right at the very start you know it's difficult to beat that for an example i think um spot play spot the drone shots i mean i picked this program at random because i happen to have uh watched it landline are one of our heaviest users um, uh, of drones. Uh, this was a company that was kind of trying to recover after the last cyclone in Queensland. Um, uh, we took a drone along to the shoot and you know had a whale of a time. There, there are some really nice pictures within it. You don't have to go mad for big reveals and things like that, but pieces like this and a couple of the other ones as well are just kind of interspersed with. Um, this went on so long actually I thought it was going to get to the drone shots by now um, but I mean you know you intersperse them in the package to to offer that different view to make them pretty pictures and things like that um, I think I didn't realize this clip was quite so long I think, we'll hang on and see if uh, some of some other bits of the drone shots and um, following a combine harvester and things like that. <laughs> uh, this was um, one from Catalyst. Uh, you know, glorious view of the, um, uh, the Parks Observatory. Um, I shot a bit of stuff for them for, the, for this piece as well, but I mean, nothing, nothing like that. It's um, really quite an extraordinary picture. Uh, and I mean, you know, the, the key thing with them as well is that they can get you into places that are just simply too dangerous. I'm sure lots of people saw this when it was going around probably about 18 months ago, two years ago now. Um, it's obviously way too dangerous to go flying over Aleppo, um, but uh, you know, somebody with a story to tell about their city uh, put this up online. How far is the range, Peter? So someone's obviously outside <coughs> the city flying this thing around. Yeah, I think standard range is 1500 meters. Uh -huh. uh, I think generally speaking, they will go to about two and a half K. Uh -huh. um, and I know people who have gone further, um, though not on ABC Business, I might add. Um, because the, 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 well, the key thing with these things is that you have to keep them in line of sight. I mean, I'll come to some of the CASA rules in a bit, but I mean, I'm sure you agree just as, a, as an interesting, um, you know, pictures that, that, that you would not otherwise. Um, have got and I mean you know going back to uh, to Neil's Four Corners story those aerials of uh, those huge water dams they would have, we would have been hiring a helicopter in the old days a thousand dollars a day um, which is just madness um, 
So there's no legal issues with taking them out over the properties? Yes, there are, <laughs> but but we weren't trespassing. We didn't we didn't trespass. It's it's we did, we didn't actually fly over their dams, right? So we're flying on we're flying on a particular farmer's land. Right? The the distortion in the lens makes it look as if we're flying over it, but we're not. Oh. We went up to it, up to the edge, and then climbed, and then that's what gives you the reveal. Because yeah, I did see the episode, so I know yes. that some farmers were a bit. Frankie. Well, we made sure that we were on public land for all of those things, for precisely that reason. Um, I mean, I'll come to some of the more, uh, some of the other um, uh, Casser examples in a minute. But I think one, one last one. I, I think I'm sure lots of people saw this as well. Um, oh, which one's this? Oh, actually, I, I tell you what, I picked out a few other ones as well. These were some last-minute additions. I fished these out from 7:30's Facebook page because they actually they've been done short-form videos. They've been offered out as you know mobile content and you know they were pretty engaging for the audience i think um this one was 80 odd 90,000 views uh they didn't actually shoot it themselves but the um uh this rainforest action network had sourced a drone flyer in indonesia who went and took the risks and got them uh those drone pictures and so on uh i think there might be another 730 example as well um this was this was like super simple this was was a little short form video got 50 odd thousand views in in in, in pretty quick time um you know a bunch of bunch of gray nomads who decided to fix up a south australian ghost town uh, there was lots more drone footage in the tv piece but you know very simple stuff just you know 10 second shot gives you a, a, a an idea of what's happening and, and this was another set of pictures from the uh, fire in the wildfires in Portugal. Mm. Um, I mean, you know, really, you, you couldn't actually have got that shot any other way. Um, and I think it, it, it gives you a real kind of feeling for, you know, for what happened there. Um, you know, real kind of power to the, to the pictures. Um, some interesting stuff that I came across this morning um, that uh, Fox News had, had put up. This was their new short form video that they put up. I think they managed to get hold of some uh, um, some really quite impressive drone footage that they got of the um, of the aftermath, uh, just showing all these flooded suburbs and things. How does the drone keep scaling that? Technology. <laughs> I don't understand. Um, I just know it works. Um, so I mean, you know, you obviously you couldn't fly uh, if it was still pouring with rain. You wouldn't put the drone up. Mm. They don't like the wet. Uh, if it was really super windy still, um, with the back end of the hurricane, you couldn't do that kind of thing. You still need a chopper for things like that. But just um, you know, for the ability to capture uh, a scene like that, then um, I think they're pretty extraordinary. Um, now, CASA, as they are affectionately known. Uh, have some rules around drones, so you can't just fly them anywhere. Uh, they have, uh, they've tried very hard, CASA, full marks to them. I've got a lot of time for, for CASA, and there's some very good people that work there. And uh, we in Australia have, um, I was gonna say lax, but that, that kind of has the wrong, that kind of has the wrong. Um, easy going? Feel, yeah, easy going. I think we have the, we have the most easy going uh, uh, drone laws amongst most of our fellow Western peers. Um, they created a, uh, a new category um, uh, in September 2016, and then they put in this nice little helpful uh, drones page. Uh, anybody who's interested in them, um, I would suggest go and have a look from the horse's mouth at what CASA says about drones and what the different regulations are and things like that. Uh, they're split basically into three sections. Uh, recreational users, you're fine. Sub two kilos commercial, that covers ABC as well. Uh, we can fly these things legally, um, but we prefer as a, well, I mean, we have to as an insurance safeguard, we have to um, verify the skills of all our pilots. Uh, but for other people, obviously the rules are very different. Um, and anything over two kilos for the commercial space uh, that's got its own separate set of rules. Um, there, it, it's very easy and digestible. And I would definitely have a look if I were you and you were interested. Uh, but running quickly through the drone rules, because I think it would be remiss of me 
not to be talking about drones if I didn't mention all of this because I bore the pants off my colleagues going on about it as well. Um, you're not allowed VR goggles. You can only do that if you're doing inside stuff. Um, and you have to fly your drone in direct line of sight. So you can't just rely on your DJI app to tell you where you are. Uh, you're not allowed to fly in populous areas and you have to stay 30 meters away from people. So everybody that you've seen flying them down at Bondi Beach, who are launching them off the beach, that's illegal. And if CASA get hold of you, it's the sliding, they, they have this points accumulation system. So for every transgression of one of their rules, they fine you, I can't remember what it is, it's like 600 bucks or 900 bucks. So uh, by the time that you've kind of gone careering around uh, Bondi Beach, you could easily rack up a pretty hefty fine. Is there a um, definition of populous areas? Well, it's deliberately vague. It is deliberately vague. Mm. And CASA acknowledged that <coughs> because, as with all of these things, it actually requires you to think and use your own judgment. Mm -hmm. right? So if, if, if you can be 30 metres away from people and happily fly your drone around without disturbing anybody, bothering anybody, flying over them, you know, if it fell out of the sky, it wouldn't hit any of them, that kind of thing, then you could successfully argue that you are not in a populous area, right? right? If you stay well away from people. Personally, I, I, I like flying around the eastern suburbs. I'll show some pictures later, but what I tend to do is I find quiet areas. I go and fly off the cliffs, I go and fly over the water, so the worst that can happen is I have to come and confess to my boss that I've drop the drone in a drink or something. Um, so th there, are, there are workarounds to all of this sort of thing, but you do have to use your head. Um, you can't fly in restricted areas, uh, and there is a CASA app uh, that they've done for this. There's also a Android version and a desktop version and things. Basically, it's a map. It'll tell you what uh, any flight restrictions are. It's free. Um, I highly recommend it. Um, You've got to keep five kilometers away from towered airports. Uh, you've got to stay below 120 meters, uh, only in daylight, only in good weather, and stay away from emergencies. Um, I'm just thinking as well about the restricted areas. It's, it's funny, a lot of places come up as being restricted areas that you don't necessarily expect. So you can't fly over the harbor without anybody's permission. Uh, you can't, uh, there are all sorts of places you can't fly. You can't, you can't fly around some of the islands, you can't. Um, you have to then go and apply for permission to fly there, which is not beyond the realms of possibility, especially if you're a, a properly licensed pilot. But um, are these on blanket rules? If, let's say, do you have different rules because you're a media organisation, or no, is it just no, no? These are, uh, I think, in the um, and aviation stuff is full of dense lingo. You just have to kind of plow through it and read what the acronyms stand for and things. But uh, these are their standard operating procedures. So, um, in the vernacular, um, so so these are your well, one, two, three, four. These are your eight commandments. Uh, a drone flight. There are all sorts of other ones that come up, but you end up finding them out as you go. Uh, but those are the main ones, um, and will keep you the right side of the law. When it comes to height restriction, does the drone record metadata? Yes, yeah. yes. The drone is recording all of your metadata. The drone is is recording extraordinary amounts of information about your flight okay. and uploading it to China, to DJI, uh, you know, all of that data, so who you are, where you're flying, how regularly you fly, how you like to fly, you know, they suck all of this stuff up, it's proprietary data, I think, as far as they're concerned. Um, you can, you can bust into it fairly easily and alter your height limit and things like that, which I obviously wouldn't recommend. Um, uh, you know, because I don't do it. I mean, you know, just because I know how to kind of thing. It, it is fairly easy, but given that everything is being recorded, there are heavy fines. And I mean, ultimately, do you actually need to fly super high? I mean, that, I think some of the picture that I've already shown you is flying really quite low. And some of the other stuff I'll show you as well, it's, it's, it, it's not about how high you are. It's, you know, it, 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 what is the shot? You know, what are you actually uh, trying to give people? So um, uh, it, I've really mentioned the Can I Fly There app. Uh, it's also, um, there's, a, there's a web app for it as well via the, um, uh, if any of you use Chrome uh, as I do. It's handy for planning jobs or if you get a bright idea that you want to go and film at, you know, I don't know, 
back to Joey Lighthouse or something, you know, you plug it into the map and it tells you whether you can fly there or not. And if you can't fly there, it tells you what the restrictions are. Um, some places come into grey areas, but you know, it's a really useful app. If you use that in Bondi, for instance, it will warn you that that entire coastal track is a helicopter pathway, for instance. So helicopters own that airspace down to 500 feet. So, you know, if you were standing on a cliff top, 100 feet up, and you fly your drone to 400 feet, which is above ground level, because that's what it's measuring your altitude in, and you've got a helicopter out at sea at 500 feet above sea level, potential for trouble. So, you know, there's, there's, there's stuff like that that you need to be aware of, you need to think of if you're in those sort of areas. And that's what CAS is trying to, um, uh, to, to tackle. Uh, right, enough about CASA. Um, uh, drones and mobile, I, uh, this is where I was kind of thinking that um, I was hoping to try and kind of bend some of the stuff that we do uh, towards something that's perhaps a bit more um, uh, relevant to what you're particularly interested in. But I mean, the thing for me that got me interested in drones is the fact that they kind of cut across all of these areas. You know, I primarily have always worked in TV. Um, uh, I've always worked in news and current affairs programs and things, so I'd always been thinking about picture and TV and all the rest of it. But I mean, these kind of things are great for any storytelling medium. It doesn't matter whether it's, it's well, not for radio, obviously, but um, <laughs> you know, you get my point. Um, uh, so I mean, you know, we've we've been looking around at um, at what we can do with them, and uh, I discovered playing around when I first got our shiny new drone. You can select your live broadcast platform from within the drone, uh, within the DJI app. So uh, I had a little play around on my personal Facebook page and things like that uh, to have a little go and got it nutted out. You can also do YouTube and uh, there's a custom one here which I will get around to looking into to see if it gives me any more freedom in terms of where I uh, stream to. Um, so anyway, we, we took the plunge and we tried a few of them. So we've put them up on the Facebook page it's not like it's you know, a, a super active part of the ABC News website, but I just wanted to put them somewhere uh, where they would all be. And um, I'll tell you what, shall I? Uh, perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll call some of them up, because I, I, was, I was really quite struck um, at uh, just <coughs> how popular they were. Um, so there we go. Go. So I had to get myself editorial rights to the page, which was no small <coughs> feat at the ABC. Uh, here we go, Drone TV. So uh, here we go, there's one from the other day. So um, I went up to, to Bilgola on the Northern Beaches and was flying around and went live and <coughs> uh, we got 30 odd thousand views, I think, at the moment. Um, so people like it and uh, you know we were getting all these uh, reactions and things um, we also started uh, we were kind of thinking about what are the other uses <laughs> what are the other uses for these kind of things so uh, I'll spare you all the sound effects for it but we left the mic open on this one um, for me and my spotter who I was working with to take requests for where to go and fly and to answer any questions because people always ask you technical things and obviously you see the things come up because this is the screen I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing when I'm filming. Um, so you can answer their questions and things and that kind of got us thinking, well, you know, is there something else you can do with it? Do you, do you have a reporter, you know, on the mic if you're flying around a news story? Uh, do you have a local historian telling you about you know, why the Captain Cook statue in Hyde Park, which you can't fly around, um, you know, or, 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 you know, the kind of thing. I mean, you know, you could, you could, it, you could pick any number of uh, sort of places where you could look at um, these sort of things. Uh, so we're ex exploring a few, um, we're just exploring a few possibilities. Well, if I'd known the, uh, if I'd known the watching the Facebook things were so popular, I'd We've done the whole thing on this. Um, now, just thinking more broadly, I will leave this going for now, actually, um, seeing as we're on some pretty pictures, and I'm not sure the other one will play. Um, but I mean, we'd also been looking at um, 
you know, what, what else we could do with, with drones themselves. I mean, aside from the journalistic endeavours, uh, you know, I put, put in a couple of ideas for recent uh, pitch processes uh, that we've had running here at the ABC for, you know, a proper drone TV programme. Uh, with like drone challenges, make it an entertainment show. Um, uh, I know slow TV is a thing at the moment, so uh, I happened to mention to this um, in very important chap I was trying to sell my idea to. I said, "What about you know a channel on iView? What about a channel on iView? We'll have um, you know drone TV channel, and we can group them thematically." Uh, you know, or you give them to the guys at Double J or Triple J, they can put them to music. I don't know, I mean, you know, you could do all sorts of things with them. Um, I mean, in terms of like what, you know, what else? Should we click off this? I'll go back to the main one. What happened with the sound on this one? There was, how did you fix that up? I remember there were sound issues originally. Oh, well, it's still pretty windy. If I turn the, uh, if I turn the sound up. Um, I'll turn this down. Well, you can hear the waves. And it's not coming through the, um, it's not coming through the speaker. Um, you get too much wind noise, that's the problem. Is it possible for you to be filming yourself if you're a mobile journalist with the drone so you could do like a, a shot of yourself? Yes, yes you could. But again, and this is the thing about having to use your head with all of these things, mm -hmm. you have to think your way around it. So <laughs> those things that we've got, those Phantom 4s, you wouldn't want to fly that anywhere near you. No, you really do. You really would be better off having that away from you. I, I got given an accident report from somebody from a third party contractor who did something for the ABC and was trying to hand catch one of these uh, and uh, mist, mistimed it and it sliced their tendons in their wrist. So um, it happens. Um, what you could do, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that DJI are going to send me a couple on uh, try out uh, is use things like the DJI Spark. So use a smaller drone, um, you know, use a smaller drone, shape your job accordingly. You know, if you want to do a first person thing, you know, get the drone to follow you or, you know, use some of the preset modes so that it stays a certain distance away from you. So, I mean, you, you can do it, yeah. but as with all of these things, you know, you do actually have to do some work to you know, to find your way through. I think I read the other day that someone released selfie drones, didn't they? Yeah. So you can throw well, that's, them. That's what that's what the spark supposedly is. Right. Um, they were marketing it as a as a selfie drone. <laughs> well, it's so small. I I, I, yeah. I went to see them when they they, they launched them, and um, we've, we we met in a boardroom uh, on the North Shore somewhere, and he was flying it around the boardroom. You know, it's mm. it's so small and so controllable uh, that you can actually do that kind of thing. Um, mm. You know, plus it's got all the facial recognition and mm. you kind of go like that. It will take a selfie and wow. you know all this sort of stuff. You can fly it like a fly it like a Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And how much do they cost? <coughs> those those are yeah. mate of mine bought one eight hundred ninety five. Okay. But. Um, you have to pay extra for the controller, and uh, my mate didn't want to pay extra for the controller, so he was operating it from a smartphone, and then he got beyond the 50 meter range of his Wi-Fi, and his drone flew away. So, <laughs> so he got it back, but then he still he still had to go and buy a controller. He still had to go and buy a controller, and I think he ended up paying more because you know because because he deserved it. Uh, <laughs> um, so just going back to uh, drag you away from our Facebook uh, stuff, I don't think that one's going to play either. Yeah, it doesn't want to play that one, which is a shame. That was some stuff that I'd shot over on the cliffs. Oh, there we go. It's crashed my, um, it's completely crashed my PowerPoint. No, oh, no, there we go. I've got it back. So, I mean, you know, there is a huge online community out there, you know, offering. Uh, this is just one of them, picked at random. I found them. Found them um, came across them when, when I first started doing this in uh, August last year. Um, and you know, there are people like that, they're trying to spread, you know, drone culture, drones for good culture. They're trying to spread the idea that you can actually use them for journalism, that you can use them to go and check for illegal land clearances. You can work with somebody to um, uh, 
put some, you know, to get some spatial mapping software, which would enable you to, you know, process the data within the pictures, and you know, prove something, whatever, whatever it is for your for your story. Um, there are all sorts of people out there. Um, this is another one that I, I found a bit while ago. She's very good. Uh, she's got a channel on YouTube. Um, you know, sometimes she does just consumer nonsense in Ewok ears. Uh, other times she does, you know, pieces about, uh, you know, her training or where she can fly and things like that. Um, you know, there are loads of, um, uh, you know, there are loads of people doing this kind of thing. Uh, I think this was our most watched on our little drone TV thing. So this was um, just out the back of, uh, where were we? We were Balgaula. Uh, Balgaula Heights at the back of Manly. So Manly's over there. And uh, we were just flying around for 20 minutes. We got 53 and a half thousand views, mm. which mm. I don't know. I mean, I started off thinking I was going to try and show my bosses what we could actually do with them and what they were capable of and that there was a, a, a level of interest I was, wasn't anticipating you know anything more than kind of you know 10,000 views tops and um, you know and we, um, and we got huge reactions for them so uh, uh, you know I think it's um, uh, and I personally I could sit and watch these all day and loads of other people they you know some people put up their um, you know their drone flying antics you know going like breakneck speed round parks racing their mates and this kind of thing for a lot of other people myself included it's it's in the creative expression of flying the thing around getting nice pictures um, and having fun doing so because uh, I think I'm a bit drone. nervous to watch this because I just think just drop into the water how how do you kind of prevent the risks of I said one of my friends had a drone for a week, he sent it up, it came down, it smashed, and that was well, the end of the drone. You, you can't, ultimately. Yeah. So what, what, what can kill them? Uh, all sorts of things. Um, uh, I was out filming some stuff and it was just way too windy. Mm -hmm. And at one point when I was trying to land it, because I realized my mistake, um, the, the, uh, a gust of wind caught it, flipped it over. Mm -hmm. um, so that would have been curtains if I'd actually persisted with trying to fly it. Um, uh, they don't like the rain. Uh, I think there are a few. I've, I found one on YouTube of when drone meets lightning. Um, <laughs> that somebody decided to put their drone up um, and put their drone up in, in a, to get a shot of an approaching uh, lightning storm. And then there's a huge flash, and then the screen's black. So, um, so they recovered the footage, though? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Well, he literally he put it straight up. He put it straight up, and wait, wait, you know, wait. and and he was busy filming around, and um, and the thing got hit. So before the um, before the session started, though, Peter, you you had a couple of smaller drones, and I guess my question is, you can buy simple drones online hmm. for twenty five, twenty six dollars. Yeah. How important is that in your learning to take on something that's considerably higher investment? Um, well, I'd, uh, I encourage I encourage all the people that we have here at the ABC. I, I always encourage them to get involved. Um, we always try and work in pairs because it's too easy to lose sight of a drone. Uh, so we work in pairs, and um, you know I'm always on the lookout for for people who can come and work with me as a spotter. So. Uh, I quite often use that as the opportunity to get other people out, you know, once you've got the shots you wanted or done the Facebook Live or whatever, if it's a quiet spot, then, you know, you let them have a go. You can also talk them through the process of, um, <coughs> you know, talk them through the process of what you actually have to do, you know, get to a location, you know, I've already checked my batteries, I've already checked there are no firmware updates, you know, I've already checked that I can fly there, but then I'll check again just before I put the drone up. I'll have a good look around me, uh, just make sure I'm not going to cause trouble for anybody. I guess what I'm asking is, is the principle of flying something simple, this similar? Can you can yes. you learn to fly on a smaller yes. drone? And well, are those when skills I, reasonably? When I first difficult? started this, um, uh, a chap from a from a, a drone filming company um, sent me a cheap drone, which I promptly smashed so these are some other ones um, but he told me they were the best ways to learn because they have little or no flight technology in them they've just got some gyroscopes to keep the thing level but it's basically all about 
learning to control the thing and understanding your orientation. I don't know how many of you play with, um, you know, play remote control cars and things when you're kids. <coughs> it's the whole thing about having your orientation. It's about, you know, be one with the drone, grasshopper. And that was all thing um, biographic? No, that's not. But then that was $26 instead of, you know, 70 which is probably so what, what it will cost you. Sort of small as you can get it, Oh, uh, I, I, I confess I'm not an expert. I think have a look in JB Hi-Fi. Um, I've bought a couple of slightly larger ones. I spent 120 bucks on one that was just crap. Um, and I haven't bothered using it. Um, it's not very good to fly and the camera's rubbish. Um, uh, but you know, there's, there are really small ones that shoot fantastic picture. Um, a Parrot, uh, which is a big French manufacturer of drones, um, they're probably number two to DJI. Uh, they make some fantastic ones. Uh, and they make theirs with cameras, uh, so they're quite good. But uh, I think have a little scout around, have a little look on forums, and see what um, see what catches your eye. Um, Can you control the, the drone and control the camera at the same time, or do you have a camera operator? On these ones, uh -huh. you're doing both. So it's a bit like you know, pat your head and rub your tummy. Um, so you have to try and do both at once. But I mean, you know, professional outfits, and I think if we had more money to spend on better drones, you know, we would buy better models that have better cameras and can fly in all kinds of weathers that do require, you know, a pilot and somebody to run the camera. And then, you know, you just concentrate on what you're doing. Um, but I mean, these, <coughs> I regard these as being, you know, pretty cost effective. Um, you know these these kits that we use even with some extra batteries and multiple charging hub and all that kind of thing is about two thousand know? dollars um, and you probably could get cheaper um, you know, or buy on eBay or something so um, anyway given the rest of my uh, PowerPoint has um, has crashed I don't think there was anything else in there anyway we can just take some uh, take some questions or things if you want. I mean, I, the only thing I would say actually is I, I, I was going to wrap up with just a bit of um, stuff about the um, you know the wider potential of drones. I mean, you know, to look in you know newspapers and online things that you know they all talk about you know it's the, the headline grabbers. It's you know it's the Amazon delivery drone. It's the Domino's pizza drone. You know, and all of this kind of nonsense. Well, you know. It's not, not, not in the short term. In the short to medium term, you know, the next five, 10 years, the big growth areas are the kind of things like environmental science, like, you know, I don't know, transporting organs from, you know, the children's hospital to, uh, you know, some poor sick child in Gosford or something. Um, or they'll be used in bush rescues or, um, I don't know, getting, drugs into flooded areas, things like that. I mean, those are the main kind of areas of, of work that have been going into it. And, you know, and leisure too. I mean, you know, people have embraced drone culture. You know, it's kind of split away from that whole, um, uh, you know, death from the air kind of narrative, really. I mean, you know, talking about selfie drones and can I use one of them to do my own piece? Well, you know, I think if, if you can't, if you can't do it, now we're in a couple of years' time, then it, it, you know, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Question on ethics. I think there's been stuff overseas about people putting up drones and getting, you know, paparazzi type pictures. What's yeah. the, what are the, where are we at in Australia? <clears throat> uh, we've, uh, we, you can't invade somebody's privacy. Mm -hmm. um, you can't trespass on their land. Uh, you can't fly over them. You can't, I mean, if you, if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to go and spy on somebody for a paparazzi shot with a with a drone, you know, you're going to have to get close. Those those are cowboys. Those are people chancing their arm. You'd have to get very close because mm. these things are designed to shoot from the air. So the lenses mean that, you know, you really do have to get close <coughs> to get the kind of stuff you want. Um, you know, they would have been flying over private property. You know, they don't give a monkeys. Um, mm. But if you know, if you stick into the rules and you you know. And you, and you don't trespass on people's property and you know you don't go and snoop on your neighbor's backyard if you fly over your neighbor's house well you know fair enough it's it's not a great look because um 
you know, if they're unhappy and reported you, then you know you could have some explaining to do to Casa. But if you're, you know, if you haven't got the camera trained on them, or you're only going <coughs> over their house, or you know, you're at 250 feet or something, you know, the, your neighbour is going to look like an ant anyway. So, mm. how does that work in in terms of? So if, if does CASA become interested at the point at which someone lodges a complaint or do they monitor footage? They, they monitor footage, they are proactive. Um, so, uh, so if you posted something on Facebook, you, zipping yeah. around Kingsford Smith Airport. They, they monitor all of those kind of things. And um, there's one that they use in, in the drone course um, that I did. Uh, where they played us this video that uh, some chap who'd, some grey nomad who'd got his shiny drone for Christmas and he was flying around uh, Huskisson and um, you know he was flying for miles and he's going up and down the main street and over people and you know dropping down over the pub beer garden and all of this kind of stuff um, and Casa left him uh, uh, left him in the comments section you know, a list of the laws that he'd broken and uh, how much he was would get fined for it. So, <laughs> and then it promptly disappeared. So, no, they don't. But I encourage all the people that fly for the ABC and, frankly, anybody flying drones. Um, to keep their flight records up to date right, with the DJI app because in the event of any trouble if you know if you've got nothing to hide you know all that metadata in there will will clear you and is so what can get access to if any if, if you went and hit somebody with your drone then yeah they would come and get your metadata and if you refuse to provide your metadata they would just you know use the blunt instrument of court and fines um, but I mean, you know, the DJI app will record everything right down to, you know, what stick you, you know, what stick movements you do, what height you are, what state are your batteries in, have you been treating your batteries properly? I mean, it, all of that sort of data is in there. So with all, okay, so with all the doom and gloom, so don't upset the Civil Aviation Authority and um, it's expensive and it can fall out of the sky. If you're interested in exploring this as a storyteller, what kind of trajectory would you encourage I mean feel free to mention some some models if you want or not but what what would you encourage someone who had not done any drone work before but was interested in exploring it as a, as a storytelling technology? Well, I think first thing would be buy a cheap one I mean these cost me $26 online um, just, you know let the kids play around with them as well at home who cares it's $26 um, and then, you know, if you're any good at it, if you've got it, if you've got the thing in your thumbs and the orientation, whatever, then then get a bigger one. Uh, and I mean, you know, it depends on how much you want to pay, basically. But as I say, those those kits, that, this is a, um, I actually brought it along in case anybody wanted to have a little look at them for anybody who's not kind of end up in this strange place where I expect everybody to be familiar with drones. But um, anyway, so that's a, that's a Phantom 4. Um, from DJI, they're the market leader in drones, consumer drones. Uh, they're branching out into industry and agriculture and things. But I mean, you know, those are tried and tested models. Um, but as I say, you know, Parrot, uh, the French manufacturer, they do some very good drones too. Uh, it so happens that we've ended up purchasing these because, as I say, tried and trusted technology, a good price, you know, long flight time, they're pretty sturdy. Um, and you know they do the job. Uh, we have bought a few of the uh, DJI Mavics, which are super compact, portable ones. Um, but we've mainly bought those for our international teams and for people who do a lot of travelling, where an extra flight case, because that's not very big, it's not even heavy. Um, uh, but an, ex an extra flight case is the last thing you want on a foreign send or anything like that. Um, and I think you know get get. get try it out and get familiar with uh, you know get familiar with drones and drone culture because you know it is actually very easy to fly in this country and it's very easy to get nice shots and it's very easy to, to you know to be able to do pretty much what you want um, 
you know, I mean, the, you know, the cancer stuff about the rules and regulations, well, you know, I mean, let's face it, don't fly within 30 meters of people. I'm okay with that. Um, you know, if I'm having a weekend and I'm enjoying a bit of quiet time in the park or sitting in my backyard, there's a guy down the road from me who's been flying his drone constantly, it's the same one as these, and he just does these laps round the <laughs> neighborhood and he's just constantly <laughs> flying over my backyard you know and it annoys me well now you can't do that because then you're responsible for what happens with the drone so if you shot it out the sky and it fell on your neighbor's <laughs> dog right and 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 killed him you'd be the one in trouble not, not, not the drone pilot. The neighbour on the left dog, I wouldn't object so much because it's no. a yappy little thing. No, perhaps, no, perhaps I have not. A, a commercial question, I guess. What if you want to capture something that has a lot of people, like it's a music festival, or, you know, like, how would you go about that? Well, it, it, again, it comes down to you look at what you want to do, you look at what the rules are, and you look at then what you actually can do. So if you're at a music concert, right, well, the people who are organizing it will presumably have a plan of, you know, where the equipment comes in and out and whatever, there'll be clear ways and things like that, right? So first up, you go, where are the clear ways? Where are there not that many people? Where can I work out of where I can see my drone and fly my drone and be within these rules? So yes, you'd be in a populous area. Um, I wouldn't do it if, I wouldn't do it if I wasn't licensed, actually, I think, thinking about it that's that's probably something that I would apply I would apply to CASA and quote them my license number and say you know <clears throat> I've done a job safety analysis I you know I've talked to the organizers uh, everybody's okay with it I'm gonna be working out of this area over to the side you know the red dot or the red cross in my enclosed diagram <clears throat> you know I'm well away from people it's a, it's a clear way so there won't be anybody operating in that area you know, I've got a walkie-talkie off security, so you know I can leave that on and keep an ear to it in case uh, you know there's something I need to know. So it's it's all about it's it's all about shaping your jobs basically, and you won't be able to just go flying out over the crowd, right? But you know, so so fly up the side of the crowd. I mean, I, <clears throat> you know, you saw from that four corners video how deceptive uh, the pictures can be. Yeah, so I mean, our, our other little trick for filming, um, our other little trick for filming cars and things like that, um, you know, or lorries on deserted highways and things, put it up at the side of the highway, you know, so that and don't go very high, so that you're not on the road. You, you know, send somebody further up the road to at least give you a hoy if anybody else comes into the area, uh, and and work at the side of the road. The 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 camera will do all the rest of the work for you and. Nobody would ever know that uh, you know you were standing in a dusty layby, getting those beautiful shots of you know the heart bus going to its next destination in rural Australia or something. And so it's it's all about just kind of applying yourself to how you can get what you want and do it legally. Got time for probably one one or two more questions. How fast can they go? About forty five. Ks an hour. According to my flight logs, my top speed is 41. <laughs> so, um, but that's just a that's, a that's an ABC drone flies thing. I think you know, <laughs> compare compare flight logs. Um, childish, I know, but yeah, uh, about 45 Ks an hour. Has there been any special event regulations or anything like that? I imagine Sydney to Hobart in the future is going to become. <laughs> well, I mean. If you think about the harbour, the harbour's no fly zone, so you've got to go asking for permission, and they just go, uh, no, Sydney Hobart. Um, when we looked into, because we have looked into Sydney Hobart a couple of years running now, and I'm going to have to look into it this year and see if there's anything that we can do. Uh, but you know, on the on the Hobart end, uh, you know, going up the Derwent, you've got all these helicopters in the sky uh, anyway, filming the race. And they're up there because of the, you know, endurance and, um, uh, you know, and range and endurance and, and, and durability because they can fly in all kinds of conditions. So I mean, basically, they just shut down the, they shut down the airspace uh, in those kind of circumstances. Uh, plus, 
I mean, if you apply the basic metrics of those castle rules I showed you, um, you know, the, the crowds everywhere, there are people everywhere, you know, there are people on the water, there are boats and chase boats and all this kind of stuff. You know, if, even if even if it wasn't a restricted area, even if they hadn't closed the airspace, if you were working, if you were working properly, you'd be kind of going, well, no, I can't, I can't fly there. You know, the only place you could do it from would be at such a distance. Then it's it's pointless. Um, oh, I should mention bushfires because that's the thing that always comes up as we head towards summer. Everybody gets terribly excited about what um, uh, journalists do anyway reporters do. They get terribly excited about the idea of filming bushfires. Um, but uh, uh, the last one on that CASA list of don'ts was um, stay away from emergency situations, bushfires in particular, because uh, these, these drones have to work really hard uh, and the batteries get really hot. So if you imagine if you were either in a bushfire zone Leaving aside any of the stuff about whether the RFS has water bombers operating or is using their own drones to track fire fronts, um, you know, you're flying about with a piece of machinery with some batteries that are probably running at about 60 or 70 degrees, um, you know, in high winds, uh, which always tend to accompany uh, uh, the bushfires, you know, in, in a tinder dry area. I mean, you know, realistically, you know, you shouldn't really be flying there, even if, strictly speaking, you could argue that you were allowed. You know, common sense, again, we're back to just applying a bit of reasoning to it. You know, common sense says, you know, don't. Or, you know, again, coming back to this thinking around what you want to get, if you simply want a vantage shot that's not from a helicopter and is close enough, well, you know, come outside the cordon, you know, launch it from a car park you know, on a, you know, and keep the drone close to you. Don't thrash it about so the batteries get really hot. Um, you know, fly it gently or, or don't fly it at all. Put it up and get an aerial view, um, you know, and land it back on the concrete. You know, th those kind of considerations will, you know, will end up, it's just creative thinking. And it's, it's the same thing most people do journalistically anyway in any kind of journalistic endeavor to try and get around something. It's just, you have to become familiar with a different set of rules. Hmm. Have you ever crashed a bird? We have had a bird strike, and in fact, Neil Maud, on that water theft story, uh, a small bird attacked him in the quarry marshes, <laughs> attacked his drone, and flipped it. It just flew at it, and it, and it hit it. Uh, we have to be very careful. Uh, when we were filming here, we saw a couple of uh, um, not an expert on my Australian birds of prey, but it was, in, it was enormous. So I would guess I would guess a sea eagle or something, because uh, I think that there are quite a few of them uh, nesting around around there. Um, and we immediately just got the drone down because they really don't like them. They're very aggressive, and uh, they they will go for your drone. Um, Minor birds get annoyed by them, but or they they get annoyed about everything. So um, and they'll just squawk, but. But in all seriousness, some birds, some birds really go for them. Some birds really go for them. So, um, you know, if you are getting a bit of bird trouble, often just put it down, wait for them to go away or move somewhere else. You said dogs try to eat them too. Oh, dogs go, dogs go nuts for them. If you, if you go out <laughs> flying somewhere, dogs, dogs go nuts for them. I got, I got, I got shouted at by some, some woman who was walking her dogs on the cliffs up near Waverley Cemetery because she, she was walking her dog off the lead and I was out on this rocky outcrop flying the drone around and this dog just came from nowhere and you know, little Timmy was gonna jump over the side to, to try and get the drone kind of thing, you know, and she's, you know, she's going nuts trying to retrieve her dog and stop it from jumping over the cliffs because this thing was just <laughs> single-minded. Um, but they, no, seriously though, they, and it, it cause, Near there is a, is a designated council dog park, so um, you know I, I've learned from experience that you know flying around, you know just find a nice open oval, and you've checked your Casa app and all the rest of it. it doesn't mean you've got nothing to worry about.